Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at eSilicon with Jack Harding, who's going to talk about what's become of ASICs and where they're headed. So, Jack, we've been talking about the death of the ASIC for years. We've been talking about the death of Moore's Law. Is this actually happening, or is it uh, continuing in a way that we didn't expect? Well, you know, that's an interesting question, Ed. You know, we've... Uh We've been hearing, particularly from our friends in the FPGA world for years, that they were going to uh, erode and, in fact, uh, knock off the uh, ASIC business. And while I'm glad to see that they've done well, um, I, at our, uh, it has not been at our expense. And today we're enjoying uh, continual growth in the ASIC market. And we're seeing particular segments in like in networking and communications that are, are exceptionally strong. And uh, that's where we've been focusing our work. But design starts overall are down, right? The chip, the complexity is going up, everything's moving into one chip, we have more functionality. How does that affect everything? Well, of course, the number of design starts have gone down because if you, if you look at a, a classic FinFET chip, uh, it might have you know, 25 to 35 blocks on there. Each block might be the equivalent of a, of a 90 nanometer chip in and of itself. So if, if, we, if we start to count transistors, uh, it's way up and to the right. If we want to count blocks, it's, pretty, it's still up and to the right gradually compared to the number of starts. But the, as we aggregate all of these blocks into a, a SOC or, or classic ASIC design, absolutely down. What's driving the change? Is it uh, IoT? Is it artificial intelligence? Where do you see it? Well, I, I think there's there's two dimensions to it. There's the smaller, faster, cheaper, better side of it, which has just the been the uh, the mantra of semiconductor forever. Uh, but specifically in the ASIC world, uh, I think there is a uh, an efficiency that can be had in terms of. Uh, yeah, even software deployment, uh, packaging, yeah, even as these, um, these uh, die are put onto uh, module class packages, you're seeing certain efficiencies at the printed circuit board level. Bigger module, yet smaller area on the PCB. So I think we're taking advantage of both the technology vector as well as the packaging go-to-market vector, and together it's been quite attractive. There's been a lot of talk that the ASICs are getting very expensive, uh, price per transistor is going up, price per gate, and as we get down into 5 nanometers, even 7 nanometers, the price goes up even further. Where do you see that trending? You know, generally speaking, we've seen better performance per process node. I mean, if you look over the last, you know, 20 years, uh, there have been a couple nodes where that hasn't been true. Uh, I think there was some uh, at 20 nanometer people were scratching their heads a little bit, but generally speaking, we're seeing um, you know more per dollar in terms of um, uh, you know density, uh, better performance, uh, cost. Uh, even even the, on the power side, we're seeing uh, some attractive outcomes. And generally speaking, it's it's packing more and more technology into a smaller space at the right price. Looking forward, it's hard for to me to project a little too much because. You know, it's um, when you get into like EUV technology, for example, it's quite difficult for us to guess as to what the transistor cost trend will be. But I'm just guessing if you look at a secular trend over the last 20 to 30 years, we'll continue to see efficiencies. And, and, and that's, you know, for those of us in the semiconductor business, that's, of course, what we're most proud of. But we are starting to see those kinds of, of issues. We are seeing EUV is probably coming online at seven nanometers, maybe five. Um, we're starting to deal with uh, vertical, horizontal nanowires. We've got uh, interconnect issues that we didn't have before. What does that do to the ability to continue down this road? Well, uh, let me harken back uh, to the beginning of my semiconductor career. In uh, 1984, I attended a, a, a seminar at the, the uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. And one of the speakers got up there and said, no chips would ever be made successfully under uh, one micron. So uh, fast forward today, uh, you, know, you know, 30 some years, uh, you're talking to someone who has infinite uh, belief and uh, optimism around our ability to, to solve those problems. So today, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I have some friends in industry who are confident that they see a clear path down to one nanometer. And, uh, you know, if being an optimist uh, and uh, historian in this field at this point, you know, I believe that's the case. So after that, we'll have to see where we go. But I think we've got a 10 or 15 year uh, horizon in front of us that still looks very, very attractive. What demands that kind of uh, development, though? In the past, we were looking at the mobile market. What's going to push it down at that level? Well, you know, in, in our particular uh, space, we do a lot of networking chips, Ed. 
And there, it, it's just uh, it's just raw performance. You know, if you look at the content, you know, that's you know over the networks, it's probably 99.9% .9 video, and that's growing exponentially. Just look at any of the YouTube statistics, for example, and and that requires you know higher and higher performance, and of course associated more and more storage. And so there's we're already talking to customers. We're working on 400 gig chips today. We're talking about you know 400, uh, 800 gig, you know, with uh, with uh, photonics. Um, there's no end to the uh, uh, consumption of performance in the networking space. Uh, that's great for those of us who are in the business. It's also interesting for those of us who like a, a, a deep technical challenge because this stuff is not easy to do. But the demand is there. Do you see the performance increasing just in terms of the chip, or do you see it in terms of the packaging and the packaging approach? So two and a half D, three D, for example, versus shrinking down to one nanometer. Yeah, you know that's that's a great point. Um, I, I think a, an important theme in general for state of the art or or bleeding edge ASICs is that you need to see a a collaboration or a, or a genuflection between all aspects of the development, from design to manufacturing to even system level issues. Um, for example, you know, signal integrity problems run right through the chip onto the module, onto the printed circuit board. All these things must be considered simultaneously. So personally, um, when you look at packaging techniques, it's just another form factor to solve some of the physics problems that exist otherwise. Today, we are making chips with 2.5D packaging technology. We are making chips with HBM. We're developing chip-to-chip -chip interfaces for split die. Uh, these chips are running reticle size, five, six hundred square millimeters, and the performance is, is running, you know, you know pushing uh, two, uh, two gig, and we're looking at you know, power consumption for some of these things in excess of 400 watts. So I'm not even sure we're making chips anymore, to tell you the truth, but without the advanced packaging technologies to which you were alluding, there'd be no way to deploy these die in a, in a, uh, a system without the infrastructure support of the package technology. So what changes from the standpoint of design and also manufacturing on this stuff? What do you have to think about now that you didn't have to think about before? Well, you know, for me, uh, I noticed that e-silicon, the, 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 the turning point for uh, how we had to think about the problem just began with FinFET in general. Um, you know, we increased the amount of, of IT processing power you know, by a factor of 20 in one year just to move into the, the FinFET space. Uh, we, we have as much storage in our company today as the world had 20 years ago on the globe in, in one small company. And so every dimension has grown geometrically and looks like there's no end in sight. Uh, you know, if you look at a, a classic, you know, FinFET uh, ASIC to development, the physical design alone can be 50,000 to 100,000 man hours. Yeah, if, if you just compare that just five years ago to a 65 nanometer uh, part, you know, maybe it was three to 4,000 man hours of development. So you can look at a geometric, if not an exponential increase across all vectors, whether it's EDA tools, IT infrastructure, um, IP complexity, uh, human participation, and then the, the, the storage of the data, et cetera. Just data manipulation alone is a, is a factor of 10 to 100 greater in this class of chip. So what I'm seeing is that it's, it's not enough, it's, it's insufficient to be able to say, I know how to make a complex ASIC. You have to be able to make a complex ASIC in its environment, in a, in a collaborative ecosystem that in fact is set up to give you a relevant, a, a, a timely solution in, in a relevant time frame. Yeah. So, so what happens on the, the ecosystem side? What's changed there? We've been dealing with IP for a while, we've been dealing with uh, basically a, a, a disaggregation of the entire supply chain. Is that still getting more disaggregated? Or is it coming together? What do you see it going? Yeah, you know, when it comes to the supply chain um, and the ecosystem, I see it swinging back the other way. Uh, you know, I, as you know, I was, I think, pretty early on to call the, the, the major disaggregation of the supply chain and build a business around it. Uh, we're seeing it different today. You know, there's, you know, you know, there's not 10 uh, foundries that can make these parts, there's three or four. Uh, there's not, you know, 20 OSAC companies that can package these things up. There's two or three. And that trend continues to be uh, a, one that we're uh, not only uh, acutely aware of, but really exploiting. So I do, do see a re-aggregation of the supply chain. When it comes to IP suppliers, I, I see a similar phenomenon. The ability to design and verify and deploy FinFET class IP 
is not for the faint of heart. And it's left the industry with fewer and fewer people who can participate uh, in, a, in a, once again, in a, in a relevant and timely way. So what changes from the customer side now? What are they looking for and who is the customer now versus what it was maybe five years ago? Well, so once again, back to the, you know, the communications and networking space, um, even server, let's say, perhaps, the, the customers has, have expanded. There's, of course, the system OEMs continue to be uh, the dominant players in that space, but we're also seeing the likes of the, the social media companies coming in because the, the expense of running their business is so heavily linked to network efficiency that it, and, and power management that it's in their best interest to have that core competency in-house as well. Or said differently, at least they're looking to talk to people that can give them a customized solution, which of course has, has been increasing the, the, the serviceable market for, for us. Um, in terms of their expectations, uh, I see a radical change there as well. You know, in the ASIC business, it used to be, you know, you'd do, you'd take the RTL and you'd synthesize it and you give the net list 75%, 95%, then 100% complete to the supplier, and in a year they'd come back with a working part. It's not that way today. Uh, today, the ASIC business is all about collaboration. We work with our customers from day one, barely after the architectural phase. We are working with them uh, in art, joint RTL development. There's parts of the peripheral, the chip that, that we are doing ourselves that we never did before. We're worried about DFT, not only at the chip level, but also implications on the board. Um, and we talk to the RTL developers daily. And frankly, I've become to take on the, the uh, opinion that unless you're working in a collaborative side-by-side -side mode on a bleeding edge chip, bleeding edge ASIC, if you will, uh, there's, no, there's no hope of a successful completion. ASICs tend to be a very select group of companies because they are so expensive to develop and it's all custom development. Is there any chance that once we start getting into 2.5D, 3D, some of these chips are going to be platforms? So they're going to be part of a solution that involves a lot of other things and maybe the chip maker is just developing the IP or some other piece that goes with this. Yeah, well, we're actually, we're seeing that today. I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, an interposer-based package provides you is the ability to reuse, uh, you know, previously developed die or use a, a m memory that up, that's off-board and, and, uh, and, and sufficient for that particular part. So I, I do see way more flexibility in the ultimate solution that's being achieved. And it's the mindset is not so much that of a die or a chip per se, it's that of a module that's going to provide a functionality under a certain power performance and area that meets the system needs. Said differently, is there's no point in building a bleeding edge FinFET class ASIC without considering the system issues simultaneously. When we first heard about packaging, one of the interesting things was that it would start mixing and matching different components. So an analog chip could be developed at 90 nanometers, analog IP, and it could go with something in the digital side that was developed at 10 nanometers. Most of what we've seen has been homogeneous. Is that starting to change? Oh, absolutely. In fact, we're already uh, developing um, ourselves and with partners uh, so-called chiplet uh, class devices that will hold you know, a Surtees class I.O., um, you know, the, at some, you know, up to 56 gigs, you know, Surtees tends to be more analog, uh, after that tends to be more digital. But this is a perfect example, nevertheless, of where a 28 nanometer, um, uh, 28 gig Surtees might be coincident with a, uh, a 14 or seven nanometer die on a two and a half D package with an interposer. And so we're already seeing the mix and match of process technology and, and mode, you know, analog versus uh, digital. And so it's, it's upon us today. Uh, what does the ecosystem look like for that when those chiplets start appearing? Is it going to be one vendor that's selling those? Is it going to be a marketplace of these chiplets? Well, I, I believe it's going to be a marketplace. I mean, I'm personally aware of uh, at least three uh, companies that are preparing to sell um, their uh, Surtees IP in, in that format. And, uh, and I think it makes a lot of sense. It's, um, there's no reason to reinvent that technology at every single uh, process node when it, it may be you know, satisfactory at previous or two, even two generations behind. So I do see a market for that. And I also see that leading into similar markets for you know, comparable technology, particularly analog, that do not need to be repeated over and over again as, as to, uh, 
to attempt to ride along with the, with the digital uh, uh, optimization. You know, the analog simply runs out of steam in terms of its, in, its natural improvement, and to leave it there as a chiplet or a, 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 a device on an interposer is, is completely acceptable. And in fact, I think it's optimal in the long run. Let's back up to about 60,000 feet here. What do you see as the major driving trends? I know going back a couple of years ago was IoT. Um, automotive certainly seems to have come on very strong very quickly. What else do you see driving the industry? Well, you know, I agree with you. IoT and, and automotive continue to fulfill their, their prophecy. Uh, of course, uh, deep learning, I think, is, um, is, a, is, the, is the mega app for the future, uh, partially because the, the deployment is still relatively new. Uh, and the uh, the software associated with with making it uh, you know consumer friendly is is still in the developmental stage, but I have high confidence that you know GPU technology or custom uh, you know deep learning uh, you know CMOS based chips will be a, a huge uh, source of demand for the future, and uh, you're starting to see that already, of course. You now, uh, similarly, uh, virtual reality has great promise, but you know I. I one of the things I've observed in my career is, you know, we've always talked, I think, with some intelligence about uh, the next big thing or the next trend that's going to happen in five years. Well, I think as an industry, we've always been right, but that five years has always been 20 years. <laughs> and so, uh, so if you're sitting here today, I, I think we, you know, the, that inflection point where everything will have semiconductor in it, and I don't mean just your cell phone and your and your your your, your camera or radio. I'm, I'm referring to. Every device in your life will be automated with semiconductors, and probably including yourself. And I think over the next 15 years, we're just going to see an explosive demand for semiconductor technology. Will it evolve in terms of its deployment, its packaging, uh, you know, even its technology? Of course it will, but no differently than it has in the last 60 years. So I, I am among those who's very, very bullish for uh, the. Uh, the demand and the excitement in this industry. And I think ASIC, which represents the custom side of that business, is a relatively small part of what we're going to see, but a critical element if we're going to fulfill the specific hardware needs of the market makers and the leaders. As you start looking at that big picture, one of the pieces that's been missing historically has been security, which becomes a much bigger problem as we start moving into autonomous vehicles, IIoT. Where do you see that evolving, and are you starting to see it showing up in some of the designs that you're doing now? You know, uh, so security has always been a uh, an afterthought in most of the, the, the chips that we've made. Uh, you know, being in the custom semiconductor business, um, I, I think people have had the luxury of considering security issues in software or elsewhere other than on the ASIC. But I am definitely seeing sources of IP that will enable uh, both um, in-chip and even off-chip internet-based control of, of the access to a particular set of circuitry. In other words, people will be able to sit at their PC and turn off chunks of a particular uh, you know, standard product or ASIC remotely. And I think that'll be an integral part of the security infrastructure, particularly for you know, threat management or response to some other uh, deployment of a system that was otherwise uh, unexpected. And so um, uh, I, I don't think it was any other choice. I mean. You know, semiconductor security is the is will be the barbed wire of the of the 1940s, and and we've got to figure it out, or it'd just be like leaving uh, every warehouse uh, wide open with the garage doors kicked open. We can't afford to live that way, and we're seeing it already. Jack Harding, thanks for another very interesting discussion. My pleasure, Ed. Good to talk to you.